My name is Danielle and I'm a second year PA student at University of Toronto. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, so I completed three years of my undergraduate degree in health sciences at the University of Waterloo. How did you hear about the PA program or what made you decide to apply? So it was actually um, an article that I read in Forbes magazine when I was in my second year um, of my undergrad. And at that time I was really considering medical school. And I came across this article and I'd never heard of PAs before. And so it kind of sounded like everything that I wanted from medicine without the things I didn't want from medicine. And it was kind of like exactly the type of career that I was looking for. And so then I started looking into it more and I decided that was the route I wanted to go. So some of the things that I wasn't really looking forward to um, in the medical field was the long hours of schooling or long years of schooling, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the stress that would be involved in those years. So yes, I would be in school for about eight to ten years, depending on what I wanted to do. But then when I really thought about how I would spend those eight to ten years, and I really thought about the stress that I would be under and sort of the quality of life that I would have in residency and fellowship, and I decided that I didn't want to spend those years that way. And the other thing that I was really considering was having a family and I knew that those years would be really important for me to build um, a financial security and a security in my relationship and take care of all those things first. And so I really thought that I wanted to be done with school before I got to that point in my life. And I know that some people choose to apply to PA school um, two years after, three years or four years. So what made you decide to apply in third year as opposed to waiting until you were done? Um, so it was kind of just on a whim. I wanted, I was, I was definitely really um, passionate about the PA program and I did spend a lot of my the end of my second year and most of my third year doing research on the profession. And I even did take um, an independent study course where I tried out my own literature review for PAs in Ontario and I got a really good sense of some of the policies and um, the laws that are in place regarding the PA profession. And so I just sort of felt like if I wanted to do it, I should just do it now and see what happens. And if not, then I can always just go back and finish my fourth year and then reapply. And so it was even a tough choice when I got in after my third year, deciding, you know, should I do this now or should I just finish up my degree? I don't want to lose this degree. But then I sort of realized that if I did really want to finish, I could always go back. And so that's why I decided to go in my third year. Mm -hmm. And. Um what, uh, what aspects of your undergrad or your uh, qualities do you think made you a competitive candidate to um, PA school? It's actually interesting. I've been asked this a couple times, um, even by preceptors and um, professors that I've met too, which is interesting. But I think it was kind of just like a accumulation of everything, you know, checking the boxes in all of the required um, sections of the application. So I felt I had a really strong GPA. I felt that I had a really strong understanding of the PA profession that I was able to demonstrate in my personal statements and also in the interview. And then I also had um, fairly high quality healthcare experience um, that was also very diverse. So for example, I was an ophthalmic technician, actually performed many of the tasks that a PA would perform in that field. So I kind of had a good understanding of patient care and how the medical system works. And then I also had experience in pharmacy, optometry, um, hospital elder life program, and some research and some anatomy stuff and teaching. So it was all just sort of everything wrapped together. So going back to the ophthalmic technician, mm -hmm. how did you go about getting that position? Um, I don't really have an interesting story for this. My best friend at the time was applying to optometry school. That was really what she wanted to do. And so in order, uh, the optometry program is very specific in what you need to apply and what you do need is experience as an optometry assistant. And so that's sort of what she was working in at the time. And um, I was looking for a job in the summer that was more clinical than what I had been doing. I was lifeguarding actually the summer before. And so I was looking for a job where I, I didn't need uh, any qualification, but that I could still get some medical experience. And so I started off um, looking for an op optometric assistant in optometry. And when I got, I started working as one and I kind of realized that it wasn't really for me, which 
I already knew anyway because I know I didn't want to become an optometrist. And so I sort of looked, um, what is the medical side of this field? And that's when I learned about ophthalmology and I sort of just put my resume out into the group of ophthalmologists in the area and one of them clicked and so therefore I got my job. Okay, so you didn't necessarily have to have actual medical experience to apply for that position? So I think what helped me get that position was the fact that I had the optometry experience okay. and the other thing was that this practice was um, not mainly, but one of the only practices that um, saw pediatric patients. And I had, at the time, also worked at a daycare, and I was really good with working with children, especially really young children. And then um, I also had some experience in the hospital with bedside manner, um, with some of the elder patients. So I think um, those qualities sort of were what made the physician take a chance with me and see what she could teach me, but it is genuinely, genuinely known that um, most ophthalmic technicians do complete a course. And so it was kind of like right place, right time. She was actually pregnant and her technician was leaving and she really needed someone just to help fill the gap. And that was just sort of how I fell into that position. So there was kind of a timeline of the jobs that I was looking for. So in the summer, I had actually dropped out of my co-op. Um, stream of my program because I didn't find that the jobs that were available through co-op were very clinically relevant or gave clinical experience. A lot of them were research positions or um, just basic non-clinical jobs. And so my friend, my best friend at the time was applying to optometry school and the requirements for optometry school are very, uh, a lot more rigid than medicine and some other programs. So she did require time working as an optometric assistant in an optometry office. And so I sort of liked that idea as well. And together we sort of got jobs at different clinics. And so I was working with an, optometri an optometrist in the community and I once I got there, it was more clerical work, a little bit of um, like assisting, doing some clinical jobs, but I sort of realized that optometry was not really the field for me, and which I knew anyway because I didn't want to be an optometrist, but I wanted something more clinical, and I that's when I actually started to apply to pharmacy jobs because I had done some research online and saw that pharmacy assistants don't really need any sort of specific training. And so I applied to basically all of the pharmacies in my area and I got a job as a pharmacy assistant at a fairly large shopper's drug mart. And so I really, I did actually like the pharmacy part of it, but I, again, I knew it wasn't really for me. Um, and I knew I didn't want to be a pharmacist at that time either. So I was looking for something even more clinical than a pharmacy assistant. And so that's sort of when I connected what I knew in optometry with what I wanted in medicine. And I came across ophthalmology and I just sort of sent my resume out to all the ophthalmologists in the area. And it was just sort of like a right place, right time. An ophthalmologist was really in need of some help. And due to my experience in the optometry, in the pharmacy, and I had also done some volunteering with some elderly patients in the hospital, on top of some of my pediatric experience working in a daycare, it sort of just all was enough to make her say, I'll take a chance with you, see what I can teach you. And that's how I got my, my most clinical job as an ophthalmic technician, which is sort of similar to the role that a PA would play in an ophthalmology practice. And I know that we get a lot of questions from pre-PAs who struggle, uh, like apart from volunteering in a hospital, how am I supposed to get these healthcare experiences in undergrad? Mm -hmm. What tips would you have for them? I would say um, don't get discouraged if you feel like you don't have any specific qualifications. I mean, I literally didn't have any specific training to become an ophthalmic technician before I got hired. I didn't have any specific training in pharmacy before I got hired and I just sort of demonstrated some of my skills through volunteer work um, such as patient communication, um, knowledge through my courses. I had some you know, pharma pharmaceutical knowledge and some medical knowledge. Um, so I put all of those things together in my resume and I just sort of presented myself and I was also I would say be eager to learn is something that employers are really looking for. Um, if they feel like they can teach you something and they need help with anything, they will probably teach you. And so that's how you get these sort of really unique and interesting experiences that can sort of bulk up your resume to PA school and make you look um, that much more clinically savvy. Mm -hmm. And apart from your, your work in the uh, medical field, uh, what volunteer or extracurricular activities were you involved in in undergrad? 
So I volunteered with a hospital elder life program, which was pretty unique in the sense that you got a lot of bedside care and bedside experience um, with some of the patients. And the goal of the program was actually to keep the elderly patients that were in the hospital um, as independent as we could so that they could transition back to wherever they were from um, seamlessly. Um, and we also had a goal of preventing delirium in these patients. So by going in and orienting them on a regular basis, having someone for them to talk to if they didn't have family and um, keeping their mind sharp with some um, mind games is sort of almost what we did. We would play chess, we would read the newspaper, help them mobilize, keep the range of motion up. And so that was a, one of my main volunteer experiences that, that I really felt made a difference for me. Um, otherwise, I did have some volunteer experience um, in anatomy cadaver lab, doing some prosection and preparing specimens for anatomy classes. I also worked as a teaching assistant in some of these anatomy classes. So I did some leadership stuff for orientation week as well. And how did you balance um, all this, all the work and extracurriculars, but also maintaining a good GPA to stay competitive? So I always tell people that the number one thing I think made me able to balance all this was actually living at home. So not having to worry about things like the grocery shopping or paying for things on time or having to work a job um, that for income, like solely for income, is I think how I was able to balance everything. I had really supportive parents that, you know, helped drive me to all these different things or, you know, I would come home to a freshly made dinner and they would help me with laundry and things like that. So I was able to really focus all of my time and energy on school and these experiences. Okay. And um, apart from that, what was your study regimen like? Like, how did you structure your time to make time for all of those activities? For some of my really hard courses, like organic chemistry, I made a point of doing a lot of group study with um, my friends in the program who we, we all had similar goals, so we would all meet at a regular time. We even, um, for the organic chemistry class in particular, we did hire a private tutor to go over some of the stuff that we would split the cost of and so that we could keep up on our knowledge. And then otherwise, um, I made sure after every class to go through the notes. Um, I usually didn't have classes back to back, so I usually had an hour or two in between classes in my undergrad, and I would use that time to make my notes, make sure I understand the notes, and then something that really helped me um, was to make my own multiple choice questions. Me and my friends would make our own multiple choice questions from the content and then send them to each other and quiz each other and really just learned all together. Okay. Do you mind if I ask what your mm -hmm. GPA was? So my GPA when I applied I think was a 3.87. Okay. 3.87. And that mostly coming from my la my third year. Obviously first year is much more difficult to get like a 4.0 GPA because um, there's a lot of adjustment that takes place when you go from high school to undergraduate. So it's sort of like an upward curve you, when you, once you get the hang of it and once you have more opportunities to take classes that um, you find yourself really good at, um, then you, you can sort of transform your GPA. So which, um, which PA schools did you end up applying to? So I did apply to both the McMaster and the University of Toronto programs and the way the timing worked out my year, I actually received my acceptance to the University of Toronto before the interview was at McMaster. So once I got that acceptance, I didn't, I cancelled my interview with McMaster because I really wanted to go to University of Toronto. And what made you decide U of T over Mac? So what was really important to me was to be able to live at home for the program and um, Given that I was, I live in Waterloo and it's not really commutable to Hamilton, um, I really valued the University of Toronto um, having the distance education set up. So that's sort of why I wanted to do that. Okay, and um, just to go back, uh, how was it filling out the supplemental application? So it was definitely, it seemed like a huge undertaking. You know, you really have to think about yourself and what you bring to the table. And I really found that using resources at my institution was really useful for me. So we had, I guess what you would call um, like a career center with um, like an application advisor, I guess, who I would work with. Um, they would really just help me tweak my supplemental application, my personal statements, and um, make them the best that they could be. 
I think I just sort of did like a free hand. I looked at all the questions, answered them as I would just off the top of my head, and then I spent a long, a long few months really editing them and adjusting them. So was it necessarily something you did within a week? Oh no, I spent probably about six months on them. Like I, I, they, I think they were exactly the same as the ones the year before, and I had even started using the ones from the year before, um, before the new one even came out. Mm-hmm. And how did you choose which references to use for some aspects of the application? So the way I chose my reference was I wanted someone who knew the most about my clinical knowledge and abilities. So I chose the um, physician who I worked with um, in ophthalmology as my reference because she really had the best understanding of my capabilities and my knowledge. And what was your process like preparing for the MMI? Um, So I used my resources again from my institution. They did have MMI, they had like a curriculum almost that you could complete online and watch some videos about the types of stations that were included in MMI and how it works. And then from there, I participated in a couple mock MMIs held by my institution as well. And then I also sat down and did a one-on-one answering some MMI type questions and getting direct feedback from my counselor. And was this all free from the institution? It was all free. That's it was incredible. really nice, yeah. So it is available to one of the students. Yeah, it's called the Career Center, and they have some great resources there. So we'll definitely link mm-hmm. to that yeah. below. Uh, so what other careers were you considering apart from PA? So I think like almost every PA student, I was really considering going into medicine um, as a physician. and. Um, Before that, I wasn't really considering anything else. Um, I thought at one point I might be a French teacher, but um, as I went further in high school, I really solidified my passion for science and um, my desire to be in medicine. Okay, and for those struggling between choosing PA or MD, Mm -hmm. uh, what would you advise? Something I actually learned this past week with Sahan was that it's really important to look at your values, strengths, and passions when you're considering, we were talking more in the sense of the type of PA career we would like, but I think in general those things are really important, and also getting a really good understanding of the two professions themselves, what it really takes to become a PA and MD, and then also what it looks like after you've already done it, what your career would look like, the things you'd be able to accomplish, the type of work life you would have, and um, take all those things into consideration before making a decision. Mm -hmm. And um, now that you're uh, two months away from graduation, um, how do you think first year of PA school prepared you for second year? So I think one of the really good things that I think all the medical programs, including the PA program, has adapted is really starting you from the ground Um, getting you into clinics right away and getting those clinical experiences um, even from like the first couple months. So I think that was really important and also really helped me find a lot of my placements in second year. So some of the relationships I was able to build in first year at my longitudinal clinical experiences um, really helped me in my second year as well. And getting used to the flow of how clinics work and really um, getting experience with patients themselves, not just some, uh, like the standardized patients that we get in school. So I think that's what really prepared me the most for second year. And then obviously a lot of the clinical knowledge that we learn from the didactic portions of the classes. Mm-hmm. And how is work-life balance in second year compared to first year? I actually found it to be a lot better. I think because I didn't really know how to do work-life balance in first year, I think I could have made it better, but it was a lot of, it was a huge learning curve in first year. And so then I felt a little bit more like I had everything under control come second year. And then I also did feel like I had more time actually on my hands, as weird as that might sound. Um, I did feel like I had more time for other things in my life in second year. And is first year more um, didactic intensive, or is there just a lot of time spent uh, learning medicine? Yeah, so uh, the first year there's just like an overwhelming amount of things, you of, of hours of lectures you need to get through, of pages of textbooks you have to read, and it sort of always feels like you can't give yourself any time to do anything because there's always something to do. Whereas in second year, you leave clinic and that's kind of it. I mean, there is sort of an expectation that you do some reading in the in the evening around some of the cases, but I felt like that was a lot more manageable in second year. And I think I should also say that my experience in second year was different than some of my classmates. I, 
I think some of my other classmates might be like, oh no, second year was way harder for me because I was in a lot of smaller teaching centers, or actually they weren't even teaching centers, they were small community hospitals, and so my hours were a lot better, and I basically did like no call and no overnight shifts, so I really had um, kind of like a different experience in clerkship. Um, I had one pre-PA student ask, uh, how much different is first-year PA school to work in undergrad? Is there a way to compare it, or how, what would you what would you say? <clears throat> So I think it's different, but also similar. So at least in the first um, semester of PA school, I found that a lot of what I was learning was a review, specifically the physiology um, and pathology. So it was very similar the way that I studied for those types of courses, the way I studied in undergrad, and actually the content was also almost identical. What I find is the biggest difference is just the actual learning of medicine itself and the thought process that you need to take when you're thinking about like history physical assessment plan that sort of mindset and way of thinking is completely different than undergrad there's nothing that really is similar to that in undergrad and so that was sort of the biggest difference that I'd say between first year PA school and undergrad. So uh, what rotations get completed for okay. if you're in second year PA school like where do you do your rotations? Okay, so in the University of Toronto program, we're actually affiliated with the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, or NASM, and part of the mission of the program is to um, provide care or provide education to our students. So half of our rotations need to be completed in Northern Ontario and half of them in Southern Ontario. So there's really no rhyme or reason to which specialties you complete in North or South. It's just sort of um, based on availability. Um, but the main specialties that we need to complete rotations in is family medicine, internal medicine, emergency medicine, pediatrics, psychiatry, and general surgery, and also women's health, which I believe is changing. I think they're actually taking that one out, but for us, we did require women's health, and then we do have two elective rotations. So the way that you decide where you do your rotations is you pick a home, a home location, so whether that's in Northern Ontario or Southern Ontario, you pick an, a home, so for me it was Waterloo, and then based on where your home location is, is depends on whether you're on a swap. So since um, my home was in the south, any rotation I did in the north was considered a swap, and therefore I was able to get housing and travel funding for those rotations. And then, for example, my one friend is from Sudbury, so her home location was Sudbury, Ontario, and therefore when she did rotations in Toronto, those were considered swap for her. And so she got funding to complete those rotations. Okay, and what rotation are you in right now? So I'm just about to start my elective rotation, which is going to be um, another family medicine in Sudbury, Ontario. So it's going to be a swap for me. Okay, and what was the rotation you were doing just before that? So just before I completed my women's health rotation in Cambridge, Ontario, which was in my home location. And what was the typical day for you as a clerk uh, in women's health? So in women's health, um, me and the physician would sort of look at the list for the day of the patients that were coming in. Um, this is on a clinic day. And we would sort of give me some of the more interesting cases because a lot can get repetitive after four weeks in the same clinic. So we would decide which cases I would see, which cases she would see, and then we would sort of go about our day and after each patient I would always go and debrief with her, present the case, and then we'd come up with a plan together. And then we would go and present the plan together. Um, and then if there were any procedures in clinic that day, like IUD insertions, PAPs, I would, I would do some of them with her assistance or sometimes I would assist her with some of them. And for some of the rotations, is there like a checklist of competencies or requirements for, for each clinical rotation? Yeah, so there are a list of required um, competencies or diagnoses that you see on each rotation. Um, they just recently were able to really hone in and condense this list so that it's much more simpler to complete for our students before it was like a really long list of like 200 things that we would have to sort of sort out where we were going to see all these things and make sure we were meeting all those criteria but now they've made it really um, concise like rotation like internal medicine you need to see these things in emergency medicine you need to see these things and so it's been really a lot easier now with that new list and is there a test that you write at the end of each rotation 
There is. So we write the end of rotation exams the same that the American PA students write, and it's through the Physician Assistant Education Association, I believe, which is an American-based um, association, and they provide us with the exams, and we write one in the last week of every rotation. Okay, and how do you study for that? I haven't really studied much for them. I felt like my rotations were giving me all of the experience that I needed, and I've been successful in all of my exams, so I really didn't study at all for them, but I know my classmates would review some of our notes from our uh, first year. They would read some textbook stuff, make sure that they, there is a list of um, things that are on these exams, so it would it would definitely be useful if you were going to study to study those things. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't really study that much, honestly. And what are some more interesting rotations that you've done apart from itself? So one that I really was not expecting to enjoy was general surgery. I really love my general surgery rotation and I've learned about myself a lot of things, one of them being that I really like performing minor procedures. And I also learned that I don't like major surgeries and I much prefer doing the little minor procedures. So I found it was every day I would wake up and I'd be so excited to go. Um, even though it was like a 7 a.m., I would be so excited because I was like, it's minor procedure day, I get to do a lot of stitching. So that was one of the rotations that I really enjoyed and also didn't expect to enjoy either. And um, any tips for PA students on how to prepare and do well for a clerkship rotation? So I'd say for um, first year PA students going into clerkship, one of the biggest pieces of advice I would have is to be very eager to learn. Um, always ask lots of questions to your supervisor. It really makes you look like you're interested and then they're probably going to teach you more just inherently when you ask more questions so you'll learn more that way. And don't be afraid to ask to do something. Um, a lot of times you may otherwise not be able to get to do something unless you ask. So it's really important that you sort of have the confidence to be able to say, hey, would you mind if I tried that? Or do you mind if I hold that? Or do you mind if I stitch that? And then you'll get a lot more experience and practice that way. So can you tell us a little bit about how the program prepares you for the job hunt after graduation? So the program itself, we actually just completed our very last residential block, and there were a lot of really good sessions geared towards, um, I think it was called preparing for your career. That was what this whole last week has been called. And so we had a lot of good sessions on like the Ontario Career Start Grant, about billing, medical directives, sort of um, finding your passions and your values and how you can translate that into the types of jobs you're looking for. And so I felt that this last week in particular has been the most helpful in sort of transitioning from being a student to being a practicing PA. And have you been working on your resumes or your resume or references? I have not started yet. That's sort of my goal um, in the next two months as I'm in my electives because actually throughout our whole um, other rotations we do have some other classes that have, were going on and they've all just sort of wrapped up so now I have more time and I'm definitely going to start working on some resumes. Can you tell us a bit about uh, what you've done to document your journey on social media? Early on in my first year of PA school, I sort of decided to start an Instagram account, um, which sort of piggybacked on top of a blog that I had already started. Um, I started it back in undergrad, actually, just writing about a few little tiny things that I thought were interesting in health and medicine. And then once I started the program, I thought it was a really great opportunity to sort of document my um, journey through PA school. And at the time, when I was applying to PA school, the only resources that I had access to was your blog and um, Sandy and Eden were the only two other public PAs that I had known and who I was reading their blog. So I sort of was just like jumping on the train with you guys and trying to add to the um, information out there about PAs and especially for students I felt I found um, it was hard to get information about what it was actually like in the program and so I wanted to be able to contribute to that and I felt that Instagram was sort of like the next way that I could just do more informal updates and provide more information that way and so that's sort of been my contribution to social media on PAs. And then the third thing that I most recently did was I tried out a vlog of like a week in the life of a PA student. I haven't been that consistent with it because it does take a lot of time to make those videos, but I think I do have another one coming up soon, which is like a day in the life of a PA clerk. Um, but otherwise, those are all of the things that I've sort of contributed to on social media. So I've gotten a lot of good feedback from the pre-PAs themselves, really sort of appreciating um, 
the detail and the things that I share and sort of giving them some inspiration and some ideas for um, PA school. And I've also gotten some good feedback from other professionals like medical students, um, chiropractors, physios, um, just connecting with all of them on social media has been really good and sort of even spreads the message about PAs even further to our colleagues as well. Good luck to all of you who are applying and always take the time to do a lot of research on the PA profession. It will not only help you once you're in school but also in your application and in your MMI. If you have a really solid understanding of the profession then you will definitely succeed.